So, a question for you to start off. Um, what are you, you're currently studying political science? No, I, I have my BA in political science, but I am mastering, uh, I'm in a master's program for international development. Um, we have a question too. Why did you agree to talk with us today? Um, because this is the essence of activism, to share um, awareness, uh, to speak up, to make sure the upcoming generations know of the struggles that other people are going through as well. Okay. Um, so we have some questions from moderator one, Hannah. Mm -hmm. I believe you, she already asked the first question. And I, they're typing them in. I don't know if you can see. And let's see. Uh, no, I don't see anything. Okay, the question is, do you, do you feel safe in the United States? Um, I did get death threats before uh, for my activism from pro-Syrian uh, regime affiliates. In terms of feeling safe in the U.S., I do feel safe. Um, I do keep the FBI up to date in terms of like what kind of um, threats that I get or um, um, of such things. So as long as you know the intelligence system has some kind of a sense of what I'm doing and um, that I need to be protected, so I'm cool with it. So some of the students, not all of them, have seen your documentary, the Hashtag Chicago Girl. Could you just give us a little background on that documentary? When got you started with that? And um, yeah. what was your role in that? Mm -hmm. So, Hashtag Chicago Girl is available on Netflix if you want to watch it. Um, it's about uh, my activism in the Syrian revolution. So, in Syria, um, we've had the same government for over 40 years. There's no such thing as elections. Um, and uh, the president just is there for however he wants, for however long he wants. Um, so, Back in 2011, a revolution started um, because the government detained uh, a group of 15-year-olds and decided to torture them and return one of their bodies um, after after doing horrible things to the kid, returned his body to the family. As soon as that went on news and, and went viral on the internet, everyone started protesting in the country against the regime. And therefore, um, we had national protests throughout the entire country. So my role um, in helping the activists on the ground is that they would organize different protests and send me video, um, raw image, uh, raw like docs, um, and I would cut it, blur their faces so their identity is not in the Syrian regime, and send it out to BBC and CNN, and that's how like the other side of the world over here sees such rising news. Uh, that was one. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I have a question for you. Uh, the other things that I help in the revolution actually uh, active. Um, Allah, you're cutting, your voice is cutting out. So my internet. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, we're here. Um, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> um, I played different roles throughout the revolution as it progressed. Right now, uh, my main concern is um, children's rights and women's rights because it got really chaotic in the country. So um, making sure that I'm connected to um, children on the ground and seeing how different international organizations are getting help to them. Okay, we're going to talk to you about uh, being able to see the moderator's questions. So real quick, on your screen, can you see a blue box in the top left-hand corner? Yes, and it's completely empty. It's completely empty, okay. So that's nothing I guess we can do as long as you can have that box. So you have all the white on the left hand, on the right hand side, you see all the white space there? Okay. I just set the question mark, did it come through? Yes. Yes. 
So you can see my arms, but I can't see yours. Okay, Hannah, can you ask that first question again? Oh, I have a question. Well, I got a question. Why is stereotyping so dangerous? Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Just keep... Okay, cool. Um, stereotyping is very dangerous in terms of um, just labeling an entire group. Um, for an example, I mean, it's very stereotypical to call a woman that wears the headscarf a terrorist or um, someone that is um, from the Middle East hot-tempered. Um, because that that's not necessarily true, and that could lead to um, an escalation um, in terms of like if we keep being our kids the stereotypes, then we're not building bridges between the upcoming generations, and therefore there's no uh, real essence of building dialogue between different groups in the country. Okay, so we live in Carson City, Nevada. As you know, and um, you know our population is mainly, you know, uh, I would say, Caucasian, Latino, um, African American, um, Asian. A much smaller population, though. We only have about sixty thousand people in Carson City, so we're not accustomed very much to see um, the headscarf. Can you talk for a moment about what the headscarf represents? Um. Yeah, so the headscarf, or it's known in Arabic or um, in different articles as the hijab, and it basically translates to the veil. Um, I wear it because I believe that a woman has to be modest. When I look at the picture of the Virgin Mary, she's covering up, and therefore, you know, as one of my idols, I would want to um, do the same. Um, not to say that if you're wearing tank tops and shorts that you're not modest. I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that each person has their own definition of modesty, and if you um, wear the headscarf, then um, you're just, th that's the way how you feel modesty should be perceived personally to you. Um, it is required in Islam, which is my religion, to wear the headscarf. Um, but again, I mean, some Muslim women don't wear it because they feel like they don't want to, um, to cover up, and that's absolutely fine. Um, so you might have Muslims uh, that don't wear the headscarf. That doesn't mean that they're less Muslim than others. It's just that necessarily, you know, she she chose not to wear the headscarf. Okay, so. Because you do wear the headscarf, um, you're walking down the street, right? And, and what happens to you when you're walking down the street in certain areas, in certain places? I know you've traveled a lot. What's the reaction? Uh, I'm stereotyped right away. Um, even if, like, so I'll give you an example. Um, Back when I was 14 years old, I was uh, walking downtown with my parents. It was 4th of July, and we were all going to see the fireworks. I was wearing my headscarf and trying to cross the road when a guy pulls down his window and yells out, watch out, she has a gun. Uh, oh, sorry, watch out, she has a bomb. So people from all around me started running away from me in fear that I really have uh, a bomb. Um, different examples of people just randomly yelling uh, racial slurs um, at me or calling me different names um, just because I wear the headscarf. Um, so I try as much as possible to raise awareness and to, to tell other people to just because a person wears a headscarf that doesn't make them less of a person than others. Um, and that will change um, because in the past, I mean, we all know this in history, different groups of people were targeted before Muslims and Jewish women were targeted because they covered up. Catholic women were targeted because they covered up. So um, it's really, um, it's a challenge and it's, <coughs> Personal, um, I, I say it's a personal struggle, uh, but at the same time, I feel like the more we know and the more we are open-minded to different cultures and society, 
the more of a stronger culture we become as a whole. So is that one way you com combat the stereotyping is by doing talks like this and? Definitely. Okay, I have another question from Hannah. Uh, are you worried family may be targeted? Um, family here in the US, uh, no, I'm not worried about because I feel safe here and they're all new. Uh, my immediate family is in the U.S., but my family back in Syria, I have about 35,000, like 11 aunts and uncles, um, and I do worry about them a lot because of my activism and my name is my pictures all over the internet is and on TV in Syria. Um, the the regime tries to get to my family, but um, and. Even I'll give another example, like, I have a cousin who has the same exact name as me and it's spelled the same exact way. And they kept, and the Syrian regime kept sending her, um, like, different threats. So she, even though she was born to different parents, and she's just my cousin, that she's not an activist or anything, but they, um, they chased her out of the country. And now she lives in a neighboring country in the Middle East. Just because she has Okay, you're cutting out a little bit again. So I'm going to repeat a little bit of what you just said. So um, Allah has a cousin in Syria who has the same name as her. And because of that, the Syrian regime targeted her cousin and harassed her to the point where she had to leave the country. Um, so now she doesn't even live in her, her own country anymore because Allah's name over there, Allah's name, excuse me, um, is well known. And that's a question that I have for you um, based on that is, are, how famous are you in Syria? Um, I'm well known with the opposition in Syria. Um, and I have a, a huge network of Syrian expatriates and activists who are not Syrian, but um, are really active in the Syrian revolution, I mean, throughout the world. Um, but to, to the government in Syria, I'm, I'm I'm well known and infamous. And infamous. Uh -huh. So, because of that, are you, do you get government protect? Do you get protection by our government? Um, no. And uh, when I was in college, the school wanted to put protection for me, but I felt like I was betraying the the real people who are struggling in syria i mean who am i to have protection in chicago meanwhile you have college students who are being i mean tortured in syrian prisons it wasn't fair and it felt like a, a too much of a privilege to to have protection here so um i declined it and i explained why and i stayed firm um with, with that do you, um, uh, do you get the feeling of giving up because it's too much? Like your, all your activism, all the things you've been doing for like, what, five years now? Um, do you ever get the feeling that just to give up? Yeah, I do. And it's the same exact when uh, you're all studying for finals and you're like, that's it, I, I give up, I can't do this anymore. Um, it's hard and it seems like especially when you're doing something and you won't see change right away happening. Um, like you said, it's five years down the road and things are getting worse. So, I do feel you're cutting out. This, your microphone's cutting out a little. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I don't that. It's just kind of in and out a little bit. Okay. I'll try to stay close. Okay. Yeah, so um, I do get I do get the a sense of like you know till when am I going to do this? But at the same time, there are children who are dying and there are innocent people who are struggling in Syria to stay alive. So it's really not fair to say, okay, I give up. I can't do this anymore. It's not a choice. Okay, Hannah has another question. Because you spend so much time on social media, what is that a plan like? Unlimited. <laughs> she 
have a really limited data plan. Data plan, and um, I have Sprint, but it's the signal is horrible in Florida, so I'm, I'm looking forward to switching to another carrier. Is it uh, is it charter communications? Say that again. Is it charter communications? Is that your carrier? Uh, I don't know what that is. We have Sprint. Oh, oh, Sprint. No wonder. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, another question, Hannah? How are you able to devote so much time to helping Syria? Um, I do. I do struggle with time now that I work full time and I study full time, but. I mean, it's less hours of sleep at night, but I think it's worth it. It's helping people overseas. It's staying connected with um, even students my age who are who are going through a war um, in that country. So it's less time to sleep at night, and because of the time difference, it's harder. But I think it's worth it. Okay, Hannah. Next question. In what ways are you still helping Syria today? Um, so I put different organizations in contact with people that need help on the ground in Syria and in different refugee camps. I keep uh, um, our um, Syria committee in the Department of, uh, of State up to date about different activists and what's going on on the ground in terms of uh, the opposition. Um, and I try to help different refugees with their um, casework to get out of Syria and into the country so they can start their life. Yeah. So now at this point, you have you more transitioned into helping um, the refugees? Correct. Because the protest and because the protests had to pretty much stop due to all the bombings. Um, protests don't really stop. They still happen uh, once a week. It's not as frequent and as vast as before um, because unfortunately a lot of people have died off and a lot of people have left the country um, so whoever is left of the activists are still protesting um, but they got the hang of it they they now have the, the different tools to get the news out of the CNN and BBC without me channeling that um, through Okay, um, could you tell us a little bit about the time that you delivered medicine and had to walk across some landmines? Yeah, um, I was 21 years old and um, I kept getting calls from different friends in Syria saying that, you know, um, and I don't want to ruin the documentary for you, but obviously I had some friends been targeted and killed by the Syrian regime. So I felt helpless from behind my laptop um, not do anything other than being online and talking to them. Um, I felt like my activism wasn't enough from behind my laptop. Um, so I got in contact with different uh, activists on the ground in Aleppo. And um, that's the second largest city in Syria. And they said that they only have um, 50 shots of insulin left. So a lot of children and a lot of elderly are going to stay without medication. I contacted different doctors throughout the Midwest, and they donated. Like within three days, I had four luggage bags of medication and insulin shots. Um, and I had all that medication in my living room. And then I asked my parents, "Okay, like what's next? Like how am I going to get this medication?" Here you go. So little by little, they got okay with the fact that I'm going to go into Syria and I'm going to smuggle the medication in. I flew into uh, Turkey, which is a neighboring country in Syria, and um, was able to meet with Syrian activists who uh, helped carry the medication into Syria. But the funny part is I didn't know I was walking on a minefield up until I got to the minefield. I thought I was just you know, going to go through customs. That's it. But um, because I am an activist and because I am targeted by the Syrian regime, I couldn't go through um, just like an airport or something like, like a regular border. Uh, 
So once we have to the huge fields, like when you walk behind them, you're stepping. Yeah, you're cutting out. The activist told me to walk behind them and watch where I'm stepping because I'm heading into a land, uh, um, a minefield. And I was shocked then, but I couldn't. I mean, if I wanted to go into Syria, that was my only way. And uh, I did it. It was 35 minutes of walking. Um, I'm not mindful, and that it was scary, but I knew that the medication I was holding and carrying was going to go to children who are dying, um, and that was going to help them and save their lives. So I uh, did it. I don't regret it, and I would do it again. So when you did that, um, did our government know that you were doing that? Um, different. People in the State Department did know, um, but they obviously did not know that I was walking on a minefield because I mean that's insane and not safe for uh, for me to do. Okay, we have another question um, from moderator two. That's Diana. How many schools have you talked to? Um, I'd say I talked to over 35 different high schools and colleges. Have you ever talked to anyone in Nevada? No, I think you guys are a first. All right. Do you plan to come visit Nevada someday? I'd love to. I can take you to Vegas, right? <laughs> that's, all the, that's where the parties are. All right. Okay, next question, Diana. Were you treated differently for helping Syria? Um, treated by who? Like, um, treated, treated differently by uh, the people around you, for example. Okay. Either, um, in, either, in, a ne either in a positive way or a negative way. Yeah, and I get both, um, depending on who I'm dealing with. Um, but I have friends who are annoyed and sick and tired of the fact that I'm never available to hang out with them or to speak with them because I'm an activist. And I have friends that truly understand the meaning of my activism and my passion for helping children and are, um, are okay with the fact that I don't get to you know, hang out with them and talk to them uh, all the time because I am busy. Do you find that you now discover who your true friends are? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And your family still supports all your efforts, I assume? Yes, they have to. <laughs> yeah. I would assume so. Um, okay, another question by Diana. You travel a lot. I do. Um, and um, I am just writing an article right now about uh, traveling while, while wearing the headscarf. Um, so maybe you can, I can, um, Shelley, the link of the article published, you can look at it, of how it means, um, of what it means to wear the headscarf and go through, yes, go through an airport. I can imagine when you have to go through security at an airport, it's going to create create issues. Yeah, I get the random check all the time. The so-called random check. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you ever considered not wearing the headscarf so you could get through security easier? Um. Yes, but at the same time, I'm a firm believer of our our rights, and I mean, freedom of religion is. It's something that our nation is built upon. So you could have whatever religion you want, wear whatever you want, and still be able to go through, you know, those uh, PSA lines without being hassled and and humiliated in front of strangers. What do you say to young people that still hold on to the idea that all Muslims are terrorists? That's not fair. Um, it's just like saying all black people, black people are only American or drunks. You know, it's it's really not fair to, to generalize. Um, most 
Islam is a religion of 1.6 billion followers. So, um, it's impossible to have 1.6 billion terrorists on this planet. So, obviously, not all Muslims are violent, not all Muslims are terrorists. Unfortunately, that shows white. Um, just like how in different Abrahamic religions you have extremists, but that doesn't make them true Christians or true Jews. Okay, how about a lighter question? Who is your favorite superhero? Uh, Batman. Nice. Okay, can you tell us why Batman is your favorite superhero? Uh, because he does good things um, when everyone else is sleeping. <laughs> So he saves he saves Gotham, which is Chicago, not New York, um, from from evil. And he keeps everyone protected. Meanwhile, he doesn't want to have to do that, but he does it out of the good of his heart. Okay. So, what do you do in your free time? Uh, I Facebook with friends, so they don't get mad at me, and I watch. Oh, here I don't know if I can say this. How old are you guys? 16, 17. 16, 17, 15, That's fine. I watched New Girl and the Big Bang Theory. So, what do you watch? New Girl and the Big Bang Theory. That's like my obsession. Do you watch any uh, Netflix series? Um, no. I, that's my goal though, like, Maybe during the break, I'll do so. When you have some free time, which you probably don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, on that note, uh, with your free, so-called free time, do you get, um, like, when you're trying to sleep, in the middle of the night, your phone is going off, I'm assuming things are happening, how do you handle that? Um, I pick it up and I answer, and I, by now, I know what's urgent and what's not urgent, and, and Who's going to send me an urgent message that really needs help uh, in Syria? So I, I try to assess while sleeping um, of whether I'm going to answer it right away or wait till the morning. But most of the time, I answer right away because, I mean, people in Syria feel helpless. They feel like the entire world has ignored their pleas. Um, so the least I can do is try to help them. On that same train of thought, how do you feel that the, the media coverage has been um, lately with what's going on in Syria? Um, media has not been fair, or at least the U.S. media has not been fair to what's going on in Syria. Um, they show that it's a fight between the Syrian government and ISIS, which is an extremist group, um, but that's not how it is. It's basically the Syrian regime and ISIS uh, are killing off activists who want a free and democratic Syria. Um, so the fight on the ground is completely different to, from what we see um, in, in the news every day. And I feel like the media focuses more on ISIS rather than showing everyone else the true meaning of of what it means to, to be a child in Syria and how much they are suffering in, in, in Aleppo without being helped from the international community. Kristen, do we have another question? Do you know uh, Laura? Of course I do. Uh, if so, what are your thoughts of what she does? Um, she is a great person. I, I have not met her personally, but I uh, worked with people in her organization. He's doing great things, and that we need more people to speak up. We need more uh, women who wear the headscarf, who really are passionate about what they believe in, to speak up in both those bridges between different communities, different countries. Yeah. On that same uh, note, so Malala obviously is is famous. You're up and coming, famous, getting famous for your activism. 
drawing attention to these issues. Um, where are the male, uh, your male counterparts? Oh, such question to a feminist? I don't know. <laughs> uh, they're busy playing video games, but I'm not being fair <laughs> to old men. <laughs> you know what? Um, I think that women, Muslim women who wear the headscarf are more visible and therefore they find it um, more of a need to speak up and to be and to voice their opinions and their and their thoughts. So um, meanwhile, Muslim males, are, if they don't have a beard or if they're not wearing a turban, then they're not known. So they can pass by, uh, you know, under the radar in society. Um, so I guess um, th there are different active male activists who are doing great things, but they're not as visible as the outspoken females. And just because we're stronger, and I can vote. I got it on <laughs> Okay, um, so some closing uh, questions for you. How do you see the conflict of Syria ending? Because as we know, it is a, just a gigantic quagmire right now. And how do you see this coming to some kind of end? Yeah, um, I do know that it will take a long time for Syria to be rebuilt and for it to become a democratic nation. Uh, it will happen. Um, and a lot of my friends on the ground have that faith and, and know that for sure, but we know that it's going to take a very long time. Um, what the U.S. can do is that we're, we're hoping that the upcoming administration um, will help get rid of the Syrian regime, will help get rid of the extremists and ISIS on the ground, and lead the way in helping um, Syrians become their own leaders and become their own um, builders in their nation. Okay, and one more question. Um, so that leads us back to that first question I asked you. Syria is very far away. Why should the people of the United States care about what's happening over there? Yeah, so, I mean, the first example that comes to mind is uh, the refugee crisis. We've seen millions and millions of refugees fled uh, to Europe and are coming to the U.S. Well, I'd say like thousands to the U.S., but millions to Europe. And I feel that um, if the, the uh, international community and the different world leaders have helped Syrians from day one in 2011, then we would have not had this refugee crisis that's going on. Um, we have an entire generation of uneducated kids because they can't go to school because their country is going to war. Um, so there are many, many problems that have built up in Syria, and it's um, an exploding time bomb if we don't help because it will, the, the problem will flood into other countries as well, and it will go it will become a bigger Middle Eastern regional problem, and we will see that in our backyard. So to avoid all, from all that happening, um, the international community led by the U.S. should do something to help Syrians um, get rid of their government uh, and transition into a democratic government. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? What are you going to be doing? Working in the um, children's funds for UNICEF to help uh, rebuild Syria and um, build the, help rebuild the education system in Syria. Do you, will you continue to do lectures like these across the United States? I hope that um, some of the students sitting in those seats will be doing those lectures. Um. A call to action. Yep. Do you have any final questions, Kristen, for Allah? Anything else besides the the last war question? There, we already talked about that. So, how do you cope with loss and tragedy? Um, 
it's not easy to cope with loss and tragedy, but um, I I find that the most the, the most therapeutic thing to do is to speak to my best friend about it and just not keep it all bottled inside um, and to write about it. Okay, I just want to thank you so much for your time today. And everybody, could you give a round of applause? documentary watch it and feel free to Facebook me I usually answer questions from uh, or comments